Hey, ever wonder what would happen if the sun decided to go boom? Like, kaboom. Imagine all that hot stuff it spits out from its fiery heart and how it could mess with everything here on Earth. Scientists are talking about this thing called a solar superstorm, which might, I repeat, might mess up the internet for weeks or even months. So here's the deal. The sun is always throwing little tantrums on its surface. Picture a solar flare like a burst of energy. Right now, we're getting close to solar max, the time when the sun acts up the most. It's like a pot about to boil over. Sometimes all that fiery energy reaches us, causing cool stuff like the northern lights up in Scandinavia. It's like the sun sending us a light show. But here's the twist. This time, it's a big one. Neil says it's like a billion atom bombs going off together. Crazy, right? So let's dive in and find out more about these solar flares and how they're gonna shake things up here on good ol' Earth. Solar flare, first of all. You have to understand that these solar flares aren't some mysterious forces that just get spawned in space. These are natural phenomena originating from the sun's corona, and they are the cause of these incredible sights. The corona is the outermost layer of the sun, and these flares that are produced on the surface of the sun happen primarily due to the magnetic field of the scorching ball of fire that's at the center of our solar system. Now, the thing about these magnetic fields is that they can twist as well as snap, and when they snap, they release a large amount of energy, energy that can literally burn our entire planet to a crisp. This is because the solar flares have the ability to heat any atmosphere they touch to millions of degrees. Whenever that happens, the particles in that heated atmosphere are charged up. As the particles get charged, the electrons as well as the protons convert this magnetic energy into kinetic and thermal energy. The result is an extremely dangerous burst of X-rays as well as plasma that can create solar flares. The plasma that's created by these solar flares has particles that carry so much energy that they are accelerated near to the speed of light. Besides that, the reason why Earth has been protected so far is because these flares don't occur in every region of our giant star. These flares actually occur in very specific parts of our Sun, known as active regions, and are a temporary feature in the Sun's atmosphere, here characterized by a very strong magnetic field. They are the most common source of violent eruptions such as coronal mass ejections, which in other words are also known as solar flares. That said, they aren't the only thing we should be worried about when it comes to our Sun, because there are other phenomena that can cause far more damage to our planet as well. A prime example of this is the flare sprays, which have the ability to speed up eruptive material so fast, it can reach velocities of 2000 km a second. The good thing is that the frequency of these solar flares is very inconsistent, and it can typically range from several times per day to less than one per week, making them somewhat less of a threat. So, we don't really know when solar flares are more likely to occur, but we do know there are certain types of solar flares, such as the X1 class flares that can occur on average eight times in the 11-year solar cycle. Then there are the minor flares, like the ones belonging to the M1 class that occur around 2,000 times per solar cycle. We say solar cycle this, solar cycle that, but what does a solar cycle actually mean? Well, we're glad you asked because the solar cycle is basically the change observed in the sun's activity. It's measured in terms of the number of sunspots that have been seen over the 11 years on the sun's surface. Bringing the conversation back, it's crucial to know that there are a lot more types of solar flares different from the M1S and X1S we talked about. This type is known for emitting gamma rays, and it's not a surprise that they're one of the most dangerous ones because of this very reason. Understanding these distinctions is incredibly crucial because it helps us grasp the varying impacts of these solar flares. Talking about impacts, did you know the duration of these solar flares also varies significantly? Although the duration of these solar flares depends heavily on the type of electromagnetic radiation that's being produced by the flare, we use it to measure the electromagnetic radiation and then calculate the wavelength. This is important because different wavelengths are emitted through different processes on the surface of the Sun. Nonetheless, we were able to discover a very clean method of calculating the duration of a solar flare by simply measuring the full width of soft X-ray flux within specific wavelength bands. We also found out that the duration of a flare can be between tens of a second to several hours, 
although this depends on the sunspot we're assuming will produce the flare. When the results were averaged out, we found that almost every solar flare will last between 6 to 11 minutes. So that begs the question, can anyone with a telescope at home just start looking at the sun and counting the sunspots on their own? The answer is no, and we highly advise you against it as well, as there's a good chance you'll damage your own eyes. There are agencies like NASA and NOAA that make sure they monitor solar activity and therefore predict solar flares. There are times when solar flares are more common. For example, if you look at the solar cycle, there's a period marked as a solar maximum and a solar minimum. These periods can be found at specific times in the 11-year solar cycle. Whenever there's a solar maximum, there's an abundance of sunspots as well as heightened solar activity, meaning that there is a greater chance that solar flares will hit Earth. The vice versa happens during the solar minimum period, where little to no solar flares are produced. Now let's get back to NASA and the NOAA, because these agencies have proper satellites, such as the Solar Dynamics Observatory, constantly monitoring the solar activity on the Sun's surface. Through these technological advancements, we're able to learn about the flares that are occurring on the Sun's surface in real time. The NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center also provides us with forecasts that have been processed by supercomputers and so are quite accurate. The question that should be cropping up in your mind right now is, how are these agencies able to protect their satellites? After all, they must be pretty close to the sun. And considering how dangerous these solar flares are, how are the satellites able to function well? Protecting the satellite is a very crucial task, especially if they're going to record data from the sun, which is why they were built using hardened electronics as well as redundant systems. We don't know a lot about these protective systems, but we do know that they use aluminum to protect their electronic systems. Let's get back to the issue at hand. Did you know that on December 14th, 2023, the sun we all love to enjoy in the winter experienced a major solar event? While we were on Earth and couldn't notice anything with the naked eye, it emitted a massive solar flare, one of the biggest ever observed. It was classified to be X2, 8, and just to remind you, X-Class is only given to the solar flares that are the most dangerous ones. The figure of X2, 8 means that the solar flare's energy was almost three times more than the base level X1 flare. If you want to understand how dangerous this solar flare actually is, imagine a billion hydrogen bombs, not atomic hydrogen bombs, going off at the same time. So what will be the consequences of this solar flare on Earth? And can we even survive complications? Well, one thing's for sure, it's not going to be something we can ignore, because the solar flares that are this potent will definitely have far-reaching consequences. For starters, you can forget about the functionality of the satellites that are in the orbit of our planet, because the radiation will definitely fry up every system that's present on these satellites. Secondly, forget about the radio, because it will directly impact radio communications on Earth. And then there are even more dangerous complications, like potential changes in the Earth's ionosphere. What's the ionosphere, you say? Well, it's basically a part of the Earth's upper atmosphere, and it's the zone where extreme ultraviolet radiations, as well as extrasolar radiations, ionize the various atoms and molecules in the atmosphere, therefore creating a layer of electrons. It's probably the most important part of our atmosphere as it reflects as well as modifies the various radio waves used for communication and navigation. So, what does all that mean? Well, to put it simply, if the solar flare that just happened on the sun reaches our planet, it can literally destroy GPS and other types of navigation systems. This solar event was monitored by many space agencies, which obviously includes NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, and there's a silver lining to it too. You see, as this was the most important solar event in a long time, it's going to provide us with a lot of data that we can use to predict future solar flares. Even though we still have some tech for these predictions, we're currently unable to protect ourselves from these dangerous solar flares and could do with a better system. The damage that was caused by the one that happened on December 14th was also quite immense. If you think about it, we got off easy, 
because the immediate impact of the flare was only on our radio communications. As we explained, solar flares have the ability to emit intense energies of electromagnetic nature. This can very easily ionize the upper atmosphere, which eventually causes disruptions in the radio signals that travel through that layer, leading to interruptions in your favorite radio show. Now, even though we make it sound like it wasn't a big deal, it did have a lot of effects on various industries that heavily depend on radio communication. For instance, communication and aviation departments and marine departments got disrupted a lot because they depended heavily on high-frequency band radio communication. The worst part about these disruptions is that we don't know how long they will last. Sometimes they can last for minutes, and other times they can go on for hours. That's not all, though, because these solar flares also have the potential to damage important satellites that are crucial to telecommunication departments. The damage, however, isn't just limited to these telecommunication satellites. They also affect geostationary satellites, although this depends on the intensity and duration of the flare that hit it. Damage to any type of geostationary satellite will result in the loss of functionality of navigational programs. Then, there's the effect on Earth's power grids, because you do understand that electromagnetic energy is very much related to electricity that travels in the power lines above your houses, right? Physics can be funny like that. So, these solar flares basically have the ability to cut out the power for an entire city. They do this by creating electrical currents within the Earth's atmosphere itself, especially in the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. The astronauts who were in space aboard the International Space Station were advised to stay in the more shielded parts of their station. These parts were called the Russian Orbital Segment, and they were asked to wear protective gear so that they are safe against the increased radiation levels. Now, even though we know a lot about our own solar system and how these solar flares work, we still don't know everything.